Can everyone hear me? All right, let's please uh, sit down and get started. We are six minutes late in getting started, so please, uh, please all take your seats. Uh, despite this uh, six-minute late start, we are going to stay very much on schedule uh, with military precision, so all speakers need to realize that. They will be cut off uh, at exactly uh, the end of their allocated time because uh, it's the only way to do this, and besides, this is a bit of a military operation. Uh, we have a lot of ex-military people here. And uh, I always run events that way anyway, I have to admit. Uh, I'm an ex-business person. I'm, I'm not, a, not, a, uh, not a professional intellectual or think tank person or whatever. So my name is Charles Davidson, and I just want to welcome you very quickly. And then Louise will make her introductory remarks, and then I will uh, segue uh, my introductory remarks into the first segment. Uh, so uh, welcome to Hudson Institute. And uh, people are sort of trickling in. We are expecting quite a few more people. Hudson, uh, as you, many of you may know, uh, became famous uh, because of Herman Kahn, the great strategic thinker, the late great strategic thinker. Uh, and so we very much live under the Herman Kahn legacy, I think one might say. And uh, Hudson's very committed to constructive engagement with the world at large, uh, to free markets, to, f to freedom in general. And uh, I think this is a very appropriate place to be hosting the event today. I'd like to thank Nate Sibley, who's floating around somewhere, who, along with Mike Gijic, did the heavy, I still, I need to learn to pronounce your last name. Sorry, uh, did the heavy lifting on all of this. There was a, it's a complicated event today. A lot of work went into this. And uh, Louise Shelley, uh, who will, uh, you will meet in just a minute, um, uh, and I did, uh, we're sort of uh, happy bystanders as Mike and Nate did all the, the heavy lifting and organization of this. Um, I think that pretty much does it. Uh, now, we have so many speakers. So these people will introduce themselves briefly. You have um, uh, uh, bios have been uh, made available. They're online also. So uh, speakers will briefly introduce themselves. And we have, uh, as you can see, everybody has 10 minutes. So there's no time for throat clearing or anecdotes or whatever. People will make their points. This will be sort of staccato boom boom. And uh, this way, we're able to pack a lot of things into the day. This day also is intended to be primarily stimulative. We're not, uh, we're not offering, a, uh, I was going to say final solutions, but that's not a good phrase. Uh, we're, we're, this is to get ideas rolling. And also, we're going to be attacking this pervasive threat from all kinds of different angles. So we're going to have a sort of uh, accumulation of all of this by the end of the day, and we'll see where we take things uh, from there. And of course, we're having these breakout sessions in the afternoon. Now, the logistics of all of that will be described uh, after lunch. There will be a buffet lunch, which will be uh, fairly decent, I am told. And um, Louise, you have uh, six minutes. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and it's delightful to see so many people here, and we're expecting more throughout the day. I'm Louise Shelley. I'm uh, the Omar and Nancy Hurst Chair at the Shah School of Policy and Government, and I direct a center called TRAC, Terrorism, Transnational Crime, and Corruption Center, which is the only center in the United States that deals with these issues. One point that I think is very important to understand about kleptocratic regimes is what they do to the citizens of the countries where they live. We're going to hear a lot about the money that flows out of kleptocratic societies, but our program doesn't say enough about what happens to people who are living under these societies. Um, if we think about Syria before it it blew up as, as we know it today, or has been destroyed and devastated by bombs. There was a 
kleptocratic regime of Basad's father, who had an agricultural policy that made no sense. It used more water than there was water. And because of the massive corruption in Syria, there were people paying enormous bribes to be digging deeper wells. And as they dug deeper wells, there was less and less water for agriculture. So prior to the Arab Spring, there was a massive urbanization in Syria, where five million people left rural areas and moved so, to urban areas. So between 2002 and 2010, you had one of the most rapid paces of urbanization in the world. And about a million and a half of those five million were farmers fleeing the drought. So what happens to them in the middle of a kleptocratic regime? They move into the peripheral areas of cities where there's no social services, where there's poor housing, no education. And if you look at and try and understand where the Arrow Sprig originated, there's some very good scientific analysis that shows a very close correlation between where the dislocated people settled and the intensity of the uprising under the Arab Spring. So this is what happens when people are living in a regime that does not care about its citizens. They, are, they become deprived of their homelands, of their source of livelihood, and move into these new megacities that are developing in many parts of the world in which water is sold often by water mafias. So people do not even have the essence of what they need to live, let alone having the education and the medical care that they need to survive. And yet that money that is being generated within those societies is coming out and being sent to offshore locales, and as we will learn today, being used by bankers and public relations firms and, and others. But there's an enormous amount of human suffering that accompanies these regimes, but it's not as if people stay and passively suffer anymore. And it is this enormous deprivation that's coming from this that is also helping to fuel the massive human displacement. Last year, we had 64 million people displaced in the world, the largest number ever recorded since we started monitoring this phenomenon, and massive amounts of human smuggling, which is also at its, at its maximum for whenever has been recorded by this. So we're dealing with citizens who are, as I would say, part of a domino effect, where you start with one element of corruption and kleptocracy, and you wind up with problems that are destabilizing other parts of the world. And that is really crucial to understand that we're all in this together. And while we can tolerate or do tolerate corruption, it has consequences for ordinary people, but those ordinary people do not just sit by and endure anymore. And they strive to move to where life is better, and yet, this becomes a problem of human smuggling and trafficking, which is now of massive proportions. So I want us to think as we explore this of the human elements of this problem, as we look at what are the larger consequences for us all in the world of illicit financial flows and corrupt political leaders who we often deal with in ways that are not very agreeable to many of the people in this room. So thank you and look forward to a fruitful discussion.